Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Okay, we're back. We're live. It's a given Thursday. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech. And this is, gee, I, I think it's Think Tech Global today is what uh -huh. it is. We're talking global. Hey, and we have the honor, uh, okay, of uh, Martin Chung Gung, uh, who is the Secretary General of the IPU, otherwise known as the Interparliamentary Union, mm -hmm. which is a global organization. Welcome, welcome to the show, Martin. Thank you very much, Jay, for having me over. Great, great to have you. So let's, let's talk about your, your reason for being here. I mean, it's quite something the Secretary General of the IPU should come to Hawaii. Why? Well, the thing is, uh, uh, we, we represent an organization that uh, uh, is made up of uh, institutions that are representative of society. And it's only normal that uh, the person who is uh, responsible for coordinating their work should reach out to the wider society and not just stay at headquarters in Geneva. So it's part of my uh, strategy to go out and uh, reach as many stakeholders as possible so that our uh, decisions and policy are really informed by the uh, interests of the people. Mm. So, I mean, we'll get to the, the mission of the IPU in a minute, but when you go out, and Amanda Ellis of the East West Center is, is your handler here, yeah. and your arranger, and your driver, I think, and uh, getting you around to various uh, events at the university and in government. Uh, and so my question is, um, you know, w when you have this experience, when you speak to people, when you educate them about the IPU, what do you tell them? What, what are your points? Well, the thing I, I tell them is that uh, we have... Uh, a common agenda, a universal agenda, and that we all have to work together. It is not legislatures doing their business, the government's doing their own business, and the people of civil society. All of us are in the same boat, and if we want to ensure sustainability in this world today, then we ha all hands have to be on deck. That's the message I'm conveying. And uh, I'm also saying that parliaments, as representatives of the people, uh, reflect the uh, interests, the diverse interests of society, and they are well placed to mediate between these interests and come up with solutions that address the broader needs of society. That's, That's the message that no I... No small task yeah. in this complex world today. It, it is. It is a, a big yeah. task. Yeah. Well, let's talk about the IPU for a minute. Yes. Established in, what, 1889? Yes. 1889. That's really ancient already and, and still going strong with uh, most of the world, most yeah. of the nations of the world are members of the IPU. Can you talk about it? Yeah, well, let me go back to 1889. Fine. When, when we were founded. That's some 130 years ago. At the time, the IPU was just an idea uh, that was put forward by two pacifists, uh, a French uh, member of parliament, Frédéric Passy, and a, a British member of parliament called uh, Alexander Kremer. The two of them created the organization, and these were pacifists in the late 19th century, and they believed in dialogue and mediation as a means of resolving conflict. They believed that countries did not have to go to war uh, for any reason. Um, that, that movement, I think, is still relevant today, that uh, we need to continue to preach dialogue. And when we look at what is going around in the world today, it's only dialogue that can help resolve conflict. And so over the years, the IPU has moved from being a group of a network of individual legislators to a global organization of 178 uh, national parliaments uh, today. We have the institutional anchor in all these uh, uh, parliaments, and uh, we are driven by the same uh, uh, ambition and aspiration, that is to make sure that parliaments are relevant to the people they represent, deliver on their expectations. And we do this in several areas. Uh, we may want to uh, talk, of course, the founding uh, values of peace, that are still relevant today, but we're also looking at human rights, gender equality as part of uh, our drive to make parliaments more representative of the broader society. We are looking at the sustainable development agenda that uh, is now uh, very topical, uh, an agenda that stresses uh, sustainability as its uh, uh, adjective uh, uh, mentions, but also looking at how you address the needs of everybody and not just a privileged few. The mantra is leaving no one behind and we think that parliaments and the IPO stand in good stead to drive that process. 
the ultimate altruism, global altruism, I think, yeah, and yeah. democracy as well. Yeah, yeah democracy, uh, yeah, we, of course, uh, when we look at democracy in the past, uh, we have uh, conceived of this in very abstract terms. We have talked about all those values that are embodied in democracy, human rights, freedom of expression, freedom of assembly, the freedom to choose one's leaders. But uh, we have never really asked that question, what do you do with democracy? What do you do with strong parliaments? Now we are beginning to address that and we are saying <coughs> that democracies are good, they, but they are not an end in itself. They are just a means towards an end, and the end is uh, better lives for the people. And parliaments are key instruments of democracy, especially strong and uh, representative parliaments. Accountable parliaments, transparent parliaments can help deliver on that aspiration. And that is where we are focusing our attention. Mm -hmm. The new development agenda, the sustainable development agenda, gives us a golden, golden platform for us to make parliaments and democracy relevant. Mm -hmm. We use the tools of democracy, the instruments of democracy, to improve upon the lives of the people. Mm -hmm. Let me unpack some of that. Yes. So one of those 187 is Iceland. Yes. Uh, the Alting in Iceland, I yes. was there a couple of weeks ago and yes. I, I was really interested to find that uh, the Alting is a legislature that was established in the year 930, mm -hmm. 930. Yes. <laughs> it's the, the oldest, oldest parliament, parliament, yeah, parliament in, the, in world. the world. That's right. And they're a member of the IPU. Oh, yeah, long standing member of the IPU and uh, very active in the IPU and uh, lots of things that we can learn from them. Uh, one thing we know is that uh, this is a parliament that, although it's, it's taped in uh, its history, is forward looking and it's got uh, what we call the Committee of the Future. The parliament today is not legislating only for the immediate uh, future but looking way into oh, uh, the f distant future. Commendable, and, uh, yes, actually. And it's something that we're encouraging many other countries to do. Yeah. So yes. and that's the other thing I wanted to ask you about. So you, you find a legislature here and one there, and yeah. they're different. And this may be you know, more advanced, more into human rights, what have you. And this one, maybe not so much. Mm. And so you have a, a, a difference of ideas, a difference of visions, maybe a difference of uh, the fairness of their operating procedures, whatever they are. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it's an opportunity for, what do I call it, legislative arbitrage. Mm -hmm. to take the good ideas from here and put them there, or to show these guys that those guys are better off and they should stop, they should cut out some bad practices mm -hmm. and, and all that. You know, raising the, the bar for everyone. Yeah. How do you do that? Yeah, first of all, uh, we do what we call standard setting. Where you have just said that uh, you have a diverse background of parliament, uh, parliaments around the world. Uh, yes, we, we believe that this is something that is legitimate. But then there are some core values and criteria by which all parliaments can be judged. First of all, we have identified a representativeness as a core criterion. Parliaments, for them to be effective, to be uh, legitimate, have to be representative of enti the entire society, not only in terms of who is in parliament or who is representing who in parliament, but in terms of the issues that are addressed in parliament. So uh, a parliament has to be representative. It has to be transparent in the way it does business. It shouldn't be this uh, secret society. It has to be accessible to uh, the people. You know, you can walk into your yeah, parliament. I was amazed at uh, the way the uh, parliament, the legislature here in Hawaii has been designed. It's open, you know, no barriers and everything. You can just walk in and uh, that is how we conceive. A state of mind. A state of mind. And we want a parliament that is accountable to the people too. They have been elected on a platform and they have to be able to report to the people on what they're doing. So we we identify those criteria, first of all, that are now universally accepted. Universal criteria. Whether you're in China or in the United States or for what you, they agree that if you want to uh, be characterized as a parliament, you have to reflect those criteria. Yeah. Then we move on, we realize that parliaments are at different stages of development. You have, you mentioned the Althingi in Iceland. That is, have been there for a long time. It's developed some capacity and knowledge over the years, and so you can say it's a fully fledged parliament. Then you have others that are challenged. There are small parliaments, there are some that are emerging from uh, situations of conflict, others that are transitioning from dictatorship to uh, 
democracy, quote unquote. And those are challenged. They lack the skills, the basic skills in terms of parliamentary procedure. Uh, the administration, for example, may be weak. And that's where we step in and we provide assistance to those parliaments. What does that assistance look like? I mean, for example, I can imagine you going in, um, making a study, um, talking to people, um, re reading the paper, whatever it may be, looking at the re resulting legislation, uh, and figuring out whether they're really up to the standard you'd like to see, or, or the, you know, the powers that be, the, the global, the global standard, uh, whether they're up to that or not. And then you would, I suppose, write a report and tell them you're not really up to the standard. You need to do this, that, and the other thing. Is that what you do? Yeah. Well, we do something that is slightly different. Uh, we don't come in with any preconceived ideas. We come in first of all. Ideally, it should come from the parliament's concern. They should. Uh, uh, request such assistance from the interparliamentary union. But sometimes we are more proactive when we realize that some parliaments are really struggling and we encourage them to seek support from the organization. And what we do is uh, we, we don't come in and say this is what is good for you and you're wrong or you, you, you're weak in this area. We sit down with them and say, okay, these are the criteria for strong parliaments. Where do you uh, lie in this uh, scale? And it's up to them to start telling us uh, that, uh, listen, we are very weak on legislation, we're weak on you know, representativeness or transparency and all of that. And so together, we identify these uh, weaknesses and strong points. There are strong points sure. too. And uh, again, then we, we work with them to put in place a roadmap for addressing those challenges. Give them suggestions. Yes. Mm -hmm. Procedural suggestions or substantive or both? Yeah, both. Uh, some countries may just be suffering, and I think yesterday we were discussing with the Senate Majority Leader here in Hawaii, some countries may, the parliamentarians may not just know uh, parliamentary procedure, how to uh, behave in parliament, uh, what the rules are, not like. And so uh, we discussed that with them and uh, uh, schooled them on, you know, parliamentary so, procedure. So educational arbitrage. Uh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. But then again, you have to move beyond that, and you're saying that uh, Parliamentary procedure is just an instrument for you to get somewhere, to make sure that you have better legislation, you have better uh, oversight of the government, and you provide the uh, resources, the budget resources to the government. And then you say, on what issues? And that's where, for instance, you take the development agenda and you say it's good for uh, the parliament to develop uh, legislation that uh, promotes renewable energies, clean energies, and sustainable and development. And in that regard, you're looking at the whole country. Yeah. It's not just the legislature. In order to determine the policies you yeah. want to suggest, you, it's for the whole country. you have yeah. to look at everything. Yes, yeah. you have to help parliament address the needs of the whole country yeah. and leave no one behind, which is important. Yeah, yes, said. yes. Yeah. So, so I yeah. ask you this. Yes. <clears throat> Can you give me an example, Martin? Yes. Of a, of, a, of a legislature in a country around the world that the IPU has had remarkable success with. Can you tell me the short story about that? Yeah, well, there are many. There are many. Uh, I think, uh, of course, the, the successes would come from those parliaments that are struggling. You know, when you take Rwanda, for instance, Rwanda that was uh, kind of uh, had traumatized by uh, genocide in uh, the early 90s. And now that parliament has emerged and is becoming a strong yeah, parliament. Very and, good. Uh, with your and, help. Yeah, with our help. We, we, we went in at a time when uh, the parliament was traumatized by, you know, they had a transitional parliament. They have graduated from a transitional parliament into a full parliament, full fledged parliament. Then you, you have that, and so they're working well now. You look at uh, Uganda next door. Uganda. Uh, uh, has been very successful in taking on the government on the issue of health. Uh, I remember several years ago we, we worked with them on maternal, newborn and child health and uh, as a result of uh, the work that we did with them, they put in place a roadmap for monitoring government action in this particular area. And I remember that the government was forced to allocate more resources to the health sector in uh, Uganda as a result of pressure from the parliament because the parliament had become aware of the importance of maternal, newborn and child health. So you have uh, little bits and pieces like that. You take Myanmar. Myanmar is a country that is emerging from, uh, well, authoritarian rule. And at the time we went into uh, Myanmar, uh, I, people would not touch them with a long pole, they'll say. Uh, 
uh, well, it's a military dictatorship. Mm -hmm. But we had to work with them because we had identified entry points. We had foreseen that uh, this parliament was opening up to the rest of the world, and we had to accompany them. And so we've put in place a program of support to that parliament that is working very well in terms of parliamentary procedures. And very importantly also, getting them to address issues that are controversial mm -hmm. and th that they don't like. Mm -hmm. the, I don't know if you know about the Rohingya issue. Yeah, yeah. So there's some bit of an accountability there. Mm -hmm. And that's the beauty of bringing this these parliaments within the fold of the IPU. Then you hold them up to certain standards. If you leave them out, they are held up to no standards and uh, they become rogue parliaments, yeah. so, uh, so to speak. Yeah. Holding yeah. up a global mirror for them. Yes. So uh, they can see I themselves clearly. Yeah. Yes. Have you had any notable lack of success in a given country? Uh, whether, you know, you went in, you tried, but the country was going the wrong direction and you could not fix it? <laughs> well, uh, <laughs> a, country, a country like uh, Burundi is a source of uh, grief for me in particular, because this is a country, uh, a parliament that was suffering in the late 90s, and uh, we went out on a limb to support them and maintain them. But uh, uh, we, the parliament has been struggling of late to uh, uh, play the role of uh, arbiter, peace arbiter within the country. And uh, it, it saddens me uh, when I, I, I go from Hawaii, I'm going to go to Burundi to try oh, to revive, mm. to revive the flame of dialogue and reconciliation in the country so that that parliament can play a strong role. Well, that's great yes. that you're going back to try again. Yes, I'm going to try. I never give up. The, <laughs> the organization never gives up. You know? So, so we, we will go back there and uh, help them. Uh, it may not be of their own making, uh, but we want to make sure that uh, we forge that political commitment uh, on the part of the, uh, the yeah. parliament, but also those stakeholders that are outside the parliament, the government, that is predominant in, Rwanda, in Burundi today. So how is the IPU funded for its activities? Uh, you get money from the United Nations or other global organizations? Oh, uh, our main source of funding comes from the public purse. Uh, each public contributions. Yeah, public contributions from the uh, uh, parliaments. They come out of government. Oh, from the parliaments yeah, the themselves. Parliaments themselves. The bulk of our funding, the COP funding, comes from uh, our uh, member parliaments. That is from the public treasury. Uh, that's what we use to run the organization. But uh, in addition to that, we have what we call voluntary funding that comes from development cooperation agencies, comes from some United Nations agencies with whom we have joint programs. They provide resources, especially when it comes to strengthening parliamentary capacity, developing standards for democracy. Uh, uh, we, we do need uh, that extra resource. And increasingly, we're reaching out to the private sector and foundations to provide resources. And I, it's, a, it, it's a challenge for us because uh, uh, the organization is very conservative and people are very worried. And each time I, I reach out to a private uh, sector entity, they're always asking me the question, are you sure the resources are clean? And I, I tell them, <laughs> yes, I have done my background check. And they say, really? It's important for yeah. credibility. Anyway. Yeah, for yeah. credibility. <laughs> Yes, so so uh, yeah, really wondering what you know this there's a dynamic in every organization yes. I always compare human organizations to bacterial colonies I'm sorry <laughs> yes. and you know there's there's various stages of development of success and failure yeah. uh, and ultimately you know the, the, the result whatever that is mm -hmm. so how do you see the IPU as having developed in the past 130 years and how do you see I mean what is the dynamic is it expanding uh, is it changing its policies and how will it change in the future. Yeah, it's, I, I told you that we started off as a, a small network of members of parliament, not parliaments, but members of individual members of parliament who uh, were driven by that common objective for promoting peace. Over the years, the organization has maintained that stance that it has to play a strong role in promoting peace and security in the world. Uh, but then uh, it has also uh, developed a strong democracy mandate because this is born out of the conviction that you cannot uh, do anything meaningful if a society, even the, if the institutions of governance are not informed by democratic standards. Right. Freedom of expression, uh, freedom of uh, association and all of that. And so we have looked at the issue of human rights. Human rights 
of members of parliament because uh, you may be surprised to know that being a parliamentarian is a fairly risky job in many countries. Mm -hmm. uh, we have currently about 600 cases of members of parliament around the world whose rights have been violated on account of having performed their duties as uh, they, they should. Very so, troubling. Yeah, troubling. So we, we, we go out to support them and uh, this is, does not endear us with many uh, governments. But I think it's important that an institution that is intended, a parliament that is intended to protect the human rights of citizens should uh, uh, function in a way that uh, is not impeded. Because if you you stifle freedom of expression of members of parliament, then you're stifling the institution. So you have that, we have moved into that. We have looked at the issue of uh, representative institutions, empowerment of women. Uh, so that's, many. you're doing more of that now? Yeah, more of that. We're making sure that, as I said, parliaments are more representative. So you have gender equality. That is that's strong. A, that's agenda. a more modern issue yeah, than more it was modern in 1889. Yes, <laughs> that's right. And then, you know, you have to branch out to the young people. You have to make sure that they are uh, into the mainstream institutions of governance mm -hmm. because they have a lot of innovative ideas that they can contribute to the way society is run. But in many countries, uh, they uh, are forsaken. For instance, we did a study a couple of years ago and we realized that uh, only 2%, less than 2% of the world parliamentarians are made up of people below the age of 30. But then these are the people who account for 51% of the sure. society. So there's a discrepancy. More and more. Yeah. Yes, there's a discrepancy. We have to fix that. And so we're promoting uh, 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 empowerment of young people. Yeah. And then a That's major very threat, modern. Yeah, uh, true. When in 1889, I don't know if they there was... They didn't think about it. I didn't think, I didn't know, I don't know if there was violent <laughs> extremism. <laughs> Nobody was over 30. <laughs> yeah, <that's, laughs> yeah, in 1889, I was saying uh, 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 terrorism was not the phenomenon we know today. Yeah. Uh, and even up to uh, some, the past several years, you could localize terrorism. But now it's become a global phenomenon. And uh, it is one of the single most so you're concerned threats. with that yeah we're doing that we're getting parliaments to uh, address the issue of violent extremism that uh, transforms into terrorism yeah uh, parliament being an institution that brings together various views you know uh, we think that it is important that that dialogue take place in parliament instead of in the streets or that certain groups of society are frustrated because their mm -hmm. issues are not taken into account so this is something that we're doing uh, more of you know and then we have the broad uh, development agenda that is now on the table uh, we also have climate change we all effects. have climate change, that's the, for sure. The, yes, the, the negative effects of climate change yeah. that we need to address. There's a lot of work yes. there. Yeah, there's a lot of work, and uh, I, I am very uh, gratified to know uh, what Hawaii is doing. They're very proactive in promoting, uh, for instance, uh, clean energy, uh, renewable energy, as a means of mitigating uh, the uh, harmful effects of climate change. That's great, and you can take yeah. that to other countries, other legislatures, and that's, that's tell them right. about what, we, what we're doing and maybe suggest uh, the same. So let me, let me shift, though, to you for a moment, Martin. Okay. <laughs> well, pleasure. How'd you get involved? You're from Cameroon. Yes. Uh, you're one of only, what, 12, since 1889, 12 uh, secretaries general of the IP. Eight. Eight. eight, I'm sorry. Eight. I'm the eighth secretary. I average the years. Yes. So it's actually, it's about 15 years is the average period of service yes. for secretaries general. Yes. So that's a long tenure, relatively speaking, as a yeah. CEO. Yeah. Um, you know, how far in are you and how did you get there? Yeah, I, actually, uh, I was elected secretary general in uh, 2014. Um, 125 years after the organization was created. And I just uh, embarked on my second term as Secretary General on the 1st of July this year, 2018, a few weeks ago. And uh, uh, it was, I think, a historic moment. Uh, people tend to, uh, tend to say, oh, you made history. But yes, I made history. But I, I want to believe that I was elected to this position uh, on account of uh, my skills and experience and qualities, not on account of having an African background. 
of course. Uh, first I, African, first, first non-European yes, in that's all right. this time. Yeah. Yes, uh, well, because the organization was created basically by the Europeans, and over the years, you know, the Europeans thought it was, uh, you know, their private preserve, for, so to speak. And uh, when I ran as uh, Secretary General, I ran against several other candidates. There were some 54 candidates, and most of them Europeans. And uh, uh, I am proud that I, I came up top. Uh, I think that it is an opportunity for me uh, and a challenge uh, because being the first African, uh, I have to prove that uh, people from other continents can also uh, deliver on uh, uh, strong, efficient institutions such as the Well, no question that the challenges lie ahead of you, Martin. Yes. Um, you know, the, uh, the Trump administration must be a, a quandary for anybody interested in the relationship of the executive branch yeah. and the legislative branch. You know, it's unprecedented in this yeah. country. Yeah. And I wonder, you know, how you see that and how the IPU sees the devolution of American democracy these days. It's very clear the Constitution is under threat. It's very clear the, the legislature is not working the way it used to work. And according to a a lot of people, it's not working well anymore. Um, where does this fit? Is this part of a global trend? Does this give you concern? Yeah, well, the thing is, I, I believe that uh, uh, what is unfolding in the, in the United States is uh, goes to the very core of the work of the IPU. That is, uh, we realize that parliaments across the world are challenged. Uh, we uh, see the dominance of the executive arms of government. We see uh, threats to uh, the institution of parliament coming from other stakeholders, be they armed groups or government officials. So uh, we need to address this. What is happening here in the United States, therefore, is not particular to the United States. But you would expect that the United States being a longer established democracy would be doing better in this particular way. And, uh, we believe, and that's the beauty of democracy, that uh, it is always work in progress, and that it is, it is a system that is self-correcting. You know, if you were in a dictatorship in the United States today, then everybody will resign their fact, uh, their self to the fact that, uh, well, we have this situation that we don't like. But no, you realize that there is a problem, and I'm sure there are efforts and attempts to fix the problem, to make sure that the balance of power is what it should be, that uh, the various institutions, uh, be the, the legislature, the government, the administration, or the judiciary are functioning at arm's length of, of each other. It is something that you have to do all the time, and you cannot be very complacent about yeah, it. Yeah. And the IPU can sort of get a bird's eye view, yes. see populism affecting the way government works in one country and then yeah. comparing changes in another country yeah. and finding global trends. Yeah. That is of so interesting and you're in a great spot to see it. Yeah. Thank you, Martin. Martin Chungong. Thank you. Very really much. appreciate your coming down. It's been a Thank you. It was a pleasure to uh, having this conversation with you today. Aloha. Thank you. I'm Jay Fidel, ThinkTech.